Greetings, everyone. Uh, happy April Fool's Day, uh, Monday, April 1st, 2024. It's hard to believe we're already into the month of April. Uh, we This is the Wolverine, uh, not a live show tonight, a pre-recorded podcast. Anthony Broom here with Clayton Safey. And we're going to do something a little bit different today. As you guys know, we typically will take questions at the end of every show. This is going to be a shorter episode that is made entirely of questions. Uh, so we went to the message board. Uh, over on the fort and gathered a bunch of stuff on football, basketball, whatever was on your guys' mind this week, and and that's what we'll tackle. So, um, Clayton, welcome back. I know we have a lot of good questions here, uh, but welcome back to the program. Yeah, great to be here. Happy Easter Monday, and I will say, well, let's start out with the debate. Is it pre-record or record? Because are we pre... How, how does that work? Well, we're... Hmm. You're right. I mean, that we're is redundant. Recording. We are just recording, um, but we're doing it pre 6 p.m. So is it an amalgamation of that? Is that how that works? I mean, there are a couple of ways you could slice it there. But uh, yeah, a little bit different this week. Uh, it will be a little bit of a different week, assuming, again, we could have news at any moment that breaks that knocks us off course. But the plan for today is obviously uh, we're doing this Q&A, you and I today. And then you and I will be back Thursday for a show that we recorded ahead of time uh, with Sam Munson of uh, pro, uh, pro Football Focus to talk a bunch of NFL draft stuff. Really get, uh, great conversation with him. Excited for you guys to be able to listen to that. But before we get into our show today, we want to talk about what we've been discussing and what we'll be discussing for years to come. Uh, the Michigan Wolverines run to a national championship that has been commemorated by us at the Wolverine via the national title book. Uh, it's available in a uh, soft magazine cover style or a hardbound book. Uh, we have a lot still left at the Wolverine on demand.com. Those of you who we've seen a bunch of pictures of people who have their pre-orders. All of those are out in the wild and have been delivered at this point. Now uh, what we have left is the stock that was ordered. So again, um, head on over to the Wolverine on demand.com. I don't have my copy of it with me today, but it is uh, again, we got in-depth features on Jim Harbaugh, Blake Corum, JJ McCarthy, Highlights on the dynamic defensive line and a bunch of other aspects of this uh, storied team at this point, 15 and 0. I, that's going to be hard to top uh, no matter what happens next in an expanded college football playoff. So, extensive game by game coverage, stunning photography. I mean, God, some of the pictures in there, I want to take them for myself and, and make prints out of them and put them up all over my house. Uh, but again, I only have so much room to do that. So, yeah, uh, be sure to get that today. Head on over to the Wolverine on demand.com again. Plenty of copies still available by my count. I think we have about 1,600 or so, a little under 1,700 still in stock between the magazine and the hardcover books. So I'll head on over there, get yours today, and enjoy. It's something you're, you'll are you be pulling that off the shelf for years to come. So, All right, Clayton, uh, we got a lot of questions in here, so we'll just kind of rapid fire it. I guess I'll ask one, we'll answer it, then maybe you take the next one, and we'll just... I guess just kind of take them in order uh, as best we see fit. So why don't you go ahead and take this first one? Well, we do have one from MD Wolverine that says starting five predictions for next year, which is damn near impossible. I don't know if you have a prediction, but uh, I mean, how? I mean, they, they, don't, they don't even have five players right now. I mean, technically speaking, I mean, the five players that are still left, um, I'm in air quotes here on video. You have Darrell Brooks, who who is signed and will stick with the program. Jace Howard has another year. Will Shetter has two more years. And Amari Burnett, Terrence Williams also have another year from that COVID year if they choose to use it. So by virtue of that being the starting five, or that being the guys that are left, I mean, that's I mean, that's not what I feel like we've probably seen lineups comparable to that this year. So that's that's what's there right now. It's so impossible to predict because uh, again, you know, I think right before we got on to to record this here, you were doing Another story about transfer portal contact. And I feel like there's been eight or nine guys reported at this point. There's probably several more that we haven't even heard about yet. And obviously the elephant in the room is those Florida Atlantic guys that, you know, have decisions to make about their future as well. So the answer to that would be the jury is still out until we know who's on this roster. No doubt. He also asks rank and order who the top three in receiving yards will be this year, which is a great question. It's also early for that as well for Michigan football. I'll, I'll go Colston Loveland, which would I, I'd be the first time a tight end has led Michigan in receiving, I believe 
since either 2017, this is just off the top of my head, or one of the Jake Butt years, um, which might have been 14 when he was a sophomore, uh, that he did it. But I'm going to go Colston Loveland, Tyler Morris, and Samaj Morgan. Okay. I'm going to go Tyler Morris, Colston Loveland, Frederick Moore. It's going to be my three there. And again, I, I think that all the production will be somewhat similar just because we know that in an ideal situation, they want to spread the ball around. And, you know, I think back to those, like that camp we covered last summer where Jim Harbaugh said, yeah, in an ideal situation, we come out of this game with four touches for this guy, four touches for this guy, five for this guy. Maybe Blake gets eight or nine carries down at Edwards, you know? So I think the philosophy, you know, even with Sharon Moore being the coach now, uh, is going to mostly stay intact in terms of not really having, I think Colston Lovins the closest thing they have to a featured guy in the passing game. Uh, but I certainly think whoever winds up playing quarterback for this team, which I'm sure there'll be questions about that later on. Yeah, it, it's, it could go either way. You know, the guy that leads in receptions might be the guy that has the least amount of touchdowns or the guy who leads in touchdowns might have the least amount of receiving yards of the three. So just a matter of game situation and how it all goes from there. Uh, we'll go on this next one here. And I think this is a really interesting storyline. Uh, something that I think you, we've talked about a little bit in terms of Michigan, Ohio state, not just from a football perspective, but Kevin J Manning one asks, why did Ohio state pass on dusty may? And how do you think it'll affect the basketball rivalry with Ohio state moving forward? I don't know that they did pass on dusty may. I, you know, they were making their hire, at the end, you know, right after the Big Ten tournament, they decided to go with Jake Diebler. I don't know that they wanted to wait on Dusty May. And it seemed like Dusty May, you know, obviously there was contact before Florida Atlantic season ended. But, you know, I don't think he wanted to take another job before his season was over with. You know, it could have been a deep run that they made in, in March like they did last year. So I think they probably said, all right, let's just go with Jake Diebler. Um, he's a great option as well. He's the guy having success. I mean, completely turned things around once he took over in Columbus, you know, after Chris Holtman was fired. So I think it was just more about them deciding, hey, we have something that might be that might be special here in house. We're not going to go somewhere else and wait. So I think it just kind of worked out in Jake Diebler's favor. But I don't know that they passed on him. And I don't know that it's necessarily going to affect the the rivalry going forward. I mean, I think that's always going to be a rivalry. Um, and you have you know, two teams now kind of entering new eras and they'll obviously have the recruiting battles and things like that. But I don't think it's going to do anything really. I think if Michigan played Louisville, you know, maybe it'd be, a, you know, something that people would talk about with Dusty May turning them down and I guess getting death threats from some Louisville fans after he did so. So that would come up, but it's it just seems like noise at, at this point. Yeah, it's not. I, I don't know that it has these big this big effect on the rivalry, but it is interesting when you think about, you know, you, you kind of view things from a wide, you know, the wide angle lens and, you know, decisions made with both football and men's basketball and decisions that were made and will be made by the athletic directors of both of these schools. I mean, obviously it's a little different, you know, between what's on the line in each sport, but, you know, entering this new era of Big Ten play, you know, it is – it is going to be interesting to see how, you know, Ward Manuel's Michigan, and it's not his, you know, he's the steward of the athletic department, but how his Michigan athletic department fares against Ross Bjork's athletic department. Because when you boil it down, I mean, these are, yeah, peer institutions, but um, they compete on a lot of levels in a lot of different sports. So we'll be interested, you know, as, as you know, we have this expanded Big Ten now and, and as the power um, – I don't want to say there's a power vacuum at the top, but as everyone kind of jockeys for position in what's coming next to college sports, I think not just men's basketball, but you know, with what's gone on with the football program, what's going on, you know, the fates of each athletic director. I think that's really interesting. Uh, something to keep an eye on. I guess I can go with uh, the next one. A series of questions from John CJ grilled CJG. Yeah. He's grilling us here with, a few different questions. We might get to all of them. Let's start with this one. Who is one? Who is running with the ones on the offensive line currently? Interesting timing. We talked to Grant Newsom today, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like, and I'll start on the interior. I mean, you know, if we had to put it on paper today, 
Um, Giovanni El Hadi, Josh Preby at guard, Greg Crippen at center. To me, it seems pretty clear that's kind of where things are at right now. You know, Miles Hinton is in the you know in the mix at left tackle. I talked about Andrew Gentry and Jeff Percy at right tackle. Does that does that sound like the five that was more or less kind of rattled off to us? Yeah, left to right, I would go Miles Hinton, Josh Preby, Greg Crippen, Giovanni El Hadi, and probably Andrew Gentry. Like you said, he uh, Grant Newsom said back and forth between Gentry. The competition's gone back and forth between Gentry and Percy, but he was listed first. It, it just feels like to me, at least, you know, having watched both of them, like I would maybe give the edge to Gentry at this point, just because of the potential I think he has, and and that now he is a junior. You know, he's coming off a two year mission. Took him maybe a year or so to get back into football shape. Had last year to kind of be groomed. And as Grant said today, he was kind of their Swiss Army knife last year, playing a couple different positions as a backup. But I feel like this is the time if he's going to settle in to uh, a spot that it's going to be this year at right tackle. So I would I, I would say those five fairly confidently. But yeah, the other four are pretty much pretty much set for the the time being. I think we're pretty accurate on those. Yeah, and I think the a lot of that battle too comes down. A lot of these battles are coming down to what does their second team offensive line look like? Because we know how important, you know, the ripple effects of even just one injury could be on what it means for the rest of the line. So um, they're going to look for their best five, not necessarily, um, you know, pigeonholing guys here or there, you know, uh, guys like Gentry and Percy have gotten work at guard too. So you never know what could happen there, but um, yeah, that sounds like more or less where things are heading. He also wants to know Clay, who is running with the twos on the defensive line? Yeah, I mean, it sounds like NL Etta moved inside to defensive tackle. Well, it doesn't just sound like it. I mean, I guess it sounds like it because Kenneth Grant said that's that is what that is what has happened. Um, so he's gone inside. I would say he's probably right there uh, as a two with Trey Pierce uh, as more of a nose tackle. Rayshon Benny out right now with the injury, but he would certainly be. I think ahead of NL Edo when he gets back, as long as everything goes according to plan with this foot injury. And then on the edges, I would say TJ Guy, who Sharon Moore mentioned as a guy who was standing out, a guy who could be a dude maybe, uh, that was standing out early on in spring ball. And then Cam Brandt, I think there, maybe at the other side, along with uh, Keyshawn Bennett could be in the mix. But I would say those are those are kind of your twos. It's not quite the, uh, the group of twos you had a year ago when it was – Josiah Stewart, Derek Moore, Kenneth Grant, you know, Cam Good, Rayshon Benny, uh, mix in there, which was ridiculous. But there's still a lot of talent there. And Trey Pierce was a guy that Mike Elson, I know, before he left, thought uh, really highly of throughout the season and said he came on at the end of last season. So, you know, I think he's probably continuing that inside. And you have a, you know, you still have a pretty good, good group of, of depth pieces there. Maybe not as much experience with the twos than you had last year, but. I mean, that's that's still a, a pretty good group that you're grooming. Yeah, and part of it, too, is people just forget how how historically deep these last few Michigan football teams have been. I mean, a lot of these guys may have gotten an opportunity. Like a TJ guy probably plays in year two or year three at any other school. But at Michigan, where, you know, you just have this depth for days at the edge rusher spot, that's one of the biggest storylines of the offseason uh, as far as we're concerned is – TJ guys transformation to the TJ dude. I wonder if they'll change the Jersey if they're, I mean, Ayabi Oki changed his name during the season. Sure. So who knows? Um, we'll see what happens there. But um, another one from John, who do you think will be tight end number two? Well, one name just keeps coming up. And I guess if we take Max Bredesen out of it, because he's kind of their fullback, he's kind of their H back. He's also a tight end, but Marlon Klein just keeps coming up. And, you know, Colson Loveland said last week that he is the biggest, fastest, and strongest tight end, um, which is crazy because the fact that somebody's uh, stronger than a Bredesen is is insane to me in that position group. And the fact that someone's faster than Colson Loveland in that position group is also crazy. And I, I followed up on on the faster comment. And I said, he's faster than you. And he said, yeah, in a straight, you know, straight line speed, he is. I mean, obviously, Colson Loveland's got a you know, quite a bit of wiggle to him as well. But I think Marlon Klein's a guy who he looked apart last year, um, you know, six foot five, 250 pounds. And I think he could play that AJ Barner role. If he played two tight ends, 58.3% of its snaps last year. They're going to need to have somebody else step up. 
because Bredesen's still going to be part of that mix, but you need another guy with the way this offense is. Um, and especially if you're going to need some safety valves in the, uh, in the passing game with a different quarterback coming in, you know, not named JJ McCarthy. So Marlon Klein just keeps coming up. Yeah. Yeah. He's uh, again, uh, been a guy. Grant Newsom was talking about him at the Rose bowl as, as a guy to keep an eye on for this year. And it sounds like, uh, he's just continues to be on that path. And Grant mentioned oh, this, him today too. Like, yeah, unprompted too. You know, he's the offensive line coach now. And you're talking about a guy at tight end. I mean, that's I think there's a fair amount of excitement there. I mean, when we talked to him at the Rose Bowl, Newsom compared him to Luke Schoonmaker. So I think they'd love if that comparison played out. And then uh what are you hearing about the quarterback position going into the spring game? Is the last of the grilling uh questions from John CJ. G. So his question also ties into the next one from RC Go Blue. So I wonder if we could just put that in a pot and kind of camp out in quarterback land for a second. Well, I'll read that one too then. That's a great call. What does Michigan need out of the quarterbacks in spring camp to not actively seek a quarterback one in the portal? I imagine that, that there will not be a starter named by the end of spring, but presumably they are looking for some sort of benchmark to be cleared by the guys in the room. Yeah, I mean – you're not going to have a starter at the end of spring ball. Anyone who thinks that you're going to walk out of this camp, with, you know, with a, pla a flag firmly planted in, you know, the Alex Orgy camp or the Davis Warren camp. And it sounds like those guys, based on what, you know, our own Chris Ballas is saying, it sounds like those two guys have been the best, quote unquote, so far. Uh, again, we don't get to see practices, so we don't know what that entails. But um, it's clear through two weeks that no one has kind of run away with this thing. I mean, everyone kind of has a trait or something they like about them. Um, even Jaden Denegal, I think he throws a good ball, but there's some mechanical things there. You know, what's the upside? Um, you know, I think for them, what this all comes down to, and I think spring ball playing out to its natural conclusion is that I, well, I'm, I won't speculate on names because I, I can't say for sure, but you're not going to have, you know, all five of these guys, you know, Orgy, uh, Denegal, Davis Warren, Jack Tuttle, who's been banged up and not really playing, and Jaden Davis, who you can almost, to me, just kind of put an asterisk next to him competing for this job because I do think that he's a year or so away, and it seems like Michigan thinks that too. So really, if it's a four per, like you're just not going into fall camp with four guys vying for the job, and I don't think that all four guys would be down for that. I think you might very well see a transfer out if that, was to occur. So, you know, I guess to come back to, to our Seagull Blues question, I mean, you know, what do you need to see out of those guys? And it, it has to be, listen, you don't need to be JJ McCarthy, but I think to run this off offense and run it at a championship caliber level, you probably have to execute it as well as Cade McNamara did a couple of years ago. And I don't know that they have that guy on the roster right now. Um, you know, there's still, as we sit here record on, April 1st, there's still 19 days to go until the spring game. Something could change. I mean, even think back to when Caden JJ uh, battled it out for that job. Um, JJ really didn't come on until what the last week to 10 days of practice, whatever it were or whatever it was that made them push that battle out. So something could change quickly, but in the here and now, I mean, you want to hear someone is grabbing the job by the horns and running away with it. And we we're not hearing that so far. Yeah, and I, I don't think that there's one benchmark that needs to be cleared because it's kind of a moving target. For mm -hmm. one, you know, you want to compare it to a couple of years ago. JJ was hurt during spring practice. You know, Jack Tuttle's hurt right now. So it's not like an even playing field in terms of all guys being available in the spring. So, you know, what benchmark is Jack Tuttle really able to clear right now? He's trying to get healthy. So that's one element. The second is, you don't know exactly what the options are going to be in the transfer portal. I'm sure they're doing their homework and are going to, you know, especially come April 15th when the transfer portal opens. But, you know, it, it's a moving target in that you don't know who's going to come available. You don't know who's going to have interest in you. So, again, you're just going to look for the best quarterback that you can have, uh, you know, behind center starting games. And whether that's a guy on the roster or a guy in the transfer portal, it remains to be seen because we don't know what all the options are. So I know it's kind of a boring answer uh, to the question, but I just don't think that there's, you know, it's just something you have to constantly evaluate because it is a moving target. Yeah, it's a moving target, um, you know, but I think it's pretty clear over the last 
three years. Like there's been a there's been a I think a pretty clear expectation set of you know the criteria that they use in terms of being able to and this is a wide ranging blanket statement or a criteria, but you know, the ability to extend plays with your legs, your ability to make every throw in the playbook, because I don't think they're going to dumb down the playbook for any of these guys. Um, you know, you adapt to your personnel, but that's, that's a little bit different. And then the ability to lead scoring drives. Um, you know, I think those are all things I assume um, that those are all things that are being charted. And again, I think if, if they were, you know, I said this, at, you know, as they kind of open spring camp and even sort of when we previewed it going into it, is that if there's an opportunity to be had for someone to enter this quarterback room and win this job, I think you would kind of start to see word get put out there that that would be the case. And um, well, I wouldn't say that the smoke is billowing out of Schimbeckler Hall, you know, hoping for someone to come save the Michigan offense at quarterback, right? But it's, uh, you know, through two weeks, it's not, it's just not where maybe it needs to be. I don't know. It's weird to say, but it's going to be fascinating. I mean, that is by far their their biggest storyline heading into the rest of this offseason, rest of spring ball. But uh, why don't you pick a next one for us, Clay? Blue 20 uh, says, when will we start to see who's in and who's out when it comes to bringing kids in from the transfer portal? Yeah, I mean, there are obviously some guys in the portal right now, uh, but it doesn't, you know, they those guys have been in for a long time. I know. So, you know, people go in daily probably uh, around college football grad, you know, graduates, but the undergrads can start going in on, on April 15th. And then you're looking at probably some chaos around college football. And that includes with Michigan. I'm curious too, you know, there will be guys that go in, I'm sure before the spring game, there will be maybe guys that go in shortly after the spring game and maybe they don't play in the spring game and the kind of the writings on the wall, although there are always kind of injuries. And if someone's not, hundred percent, especially if they're a veteran, there's no reason to risk it. Michigan usually holds those guys out anyway. So it's tough to say exactly what each, you know, the situation is for each guy, but I think April 15th is going to be crazy. I think the days leading up to that around the country, there are going to be guys making announcements that they intend on heading into the portal on April 15th, Carmelo English, you know, put out a statement. Uh, what was last weekend um, or, or two weekends ago now that he is leaving uh, when the portal opens then. So you're going to see chaos in and out. And I think the in part is really important because, yeah, you are going to lose some people, of course, but you're also going to get some probably good players that, that come in uh, You know, as time goes on. The guys leaving, we will know much earlier than the guys coming. I mean, you could get a commit in June. Uh, the portal window is only for guys entering. They have to enter within that 15-day window till April 30th. So, uh, you know, Josh Wallace came in June last year, you know, committed to Michigan, joins the team, and, you know, he was rocking and rolling once fall camp came around. There's also going to be guys that, you know, you, like Ayabi Oki a couple of years ago that came to Michigan. 13, 13 days before the opener. Yeah, in, in mid-August. So you could have um, – it, it's never going to stop, it, it seems like, at this point. But in terms of guys going in, we'll know in, in fairly short order. And, you know, by the time mid-April comes around and at the very least – before April 30th for undergrads. You know, and something I thought that was interesting too, we talked to um, new but familiar linebackers coach, uh, Brian Jean-Marie on Monday afternoon. And someone asked him about, you know, what those conversations are like. And he said a lot more of the conversations they have with players now is players want to know up front, like where do they stand? Like what's, where are they at on the depth chart? So, you know, I don't, th you know, when, when players or when coaches kind of talk about, and, and, I think a lot of coaches, especially Jim Harbaugh, was great at this. You know, if you asked him a question about the depth chart, he'd just list off his entire roster. But, um, you know, I think that when you see these depth charts kind of come together based on what we hear from practices, based on what coaches are saying, it's not super hard to put together a list of candidates of guys that might be, you know, on their way, you know, guys who might look elsewhere just based on the fact you're not really hearing their name a ton, but uh, we'll see. I mean, I think in, in this era, anyone and anyone, you know, anyone and everyone could have some sort of price tag that entices them to the portal now. So we'll see. I think that things are a lot more stable than some people may have expected at Michigan, given that there was all that change, but 
you know, they have a core group of guys here, Will Johnson, Mason Graham, Kenneth Grant, Colston Loveland, et cetera, that it seems like have kind of come together and rallied around the fact that they're going to see this thing through and that, um, you know, they're not going to cut and run. So again, things could change. You never know, but uh, they feel like it feels like they're in a pretty good uh, spot right now. Uh, how about a hockey question? You were asking for this in the post, Clay, so I will deliver for you. Uh, this is one from our guy, Jack Napier, who says, I see slash hear whispers of discontent with Brandon Narado. How do you view him in his two scenes, seasons at Michigan? Uh, two seasons, two frozen fours. I mean, it's hard to see it any other way than a smashing success. I know it can be frustrating at times, given that they usually start a little slow and then those guys leave for a month or so to play at world juniors. But, you know, even under Mel Pearson, even under red Barons, it feels like they figure things out, you know, in, in March, uh, in early April. And, you know, they haven't won a national title since 1998. I think, uh, it's incredibly tough to do, but when you look at the amount of talent that they bring in from this U S national team, I think they're a threat to win it anytime they get in. And, and certainly this year, a little more under the radar. We'll see if that unlocks something with them, but, um, Brandon Narado, I mean, it's, it's tough to, it's tough to argue with any of it. Yeah. January, February Narado, um, is, is what they're saying. And he, I'm sure he wants that to be, you know, April to be his month, uh, because Michigan has been, snake bitten so many times as you mentioned haven't won since 1998 but they have more frozen fours than anybody it's the third straight frozen four i don't you know I, maybe i saw some discontent back in december january maybe even part of february but like you said they they start to play their best hockey towards the end of the year and that's what happens when you have young teams that are really talented like everyone knows that michigan has tremendous upside but when you are sending guys to the nhl every year and you have to replace a bunch of guys, then you you do, you're able to with a bunch of talented players um, it, that are 18, 19 years old, you know, it might take a little bit of time. And I think we've seen that, uh, you know, they lose last year in the Frozen Four to an extremely experienced team in Quinnipiac that ended up winning the national championship. That's always going to be tough. Like when there is a, a top tier team that has all this experience, you're going to run into that. And, you know, it's going to be a challenge. Michigan, you know, facing Boston College in in St. Paul in a couple weekends, but I mean, I, I think that Brandon Naredo's tenure has been great so far. I mean, he wasn't even the permanent head coach uh, a year ago today. Uh, I don't I don't know the exact date, but I mean, he got promoted heading into the Frozen Four, and you know, so he didn't even have the staff that he wanted you know, going into his first season. Then he was able to do that this past year, and I talked to, to him about this on the phone before the season, uh, you know, where he was like, I'm finally able to get aces in their places where this is a staff I want. We They have a goalies coach for the first time at Michigan in a long time. They have, you know, a coach specifically dedicated to defense. Like it's year one of him having everything in place. And I'm sure he'll, he'll continue to tweak, but I think he's done a really good job. I know I joked a few weeks ago about taking the interim tag away and, and giving it back. It, it's just a joke. I mean, Brandon Naredo's done a great job. And the fact that they were able to beat Michigan State, who has beaten them all year, you know, won four out of five games leading into the NCAA tournament. They beat them in overtime in East Lansing eight days prior. But then they go and beat them five to two, outplayed them, you know, pretty much the entire game, maybe some, uh, other than the beginning part in the first period. Says a lot about the way he's been able to, you know, get this team to improve throughout the season. It says a lot about you know his in-game coaching chops, and and what they did on uh, on Sunday night was just downright fun to watch, and uh, you know some incredible plays, uh, some incredible goals, better defense, good goaltending, and they're headed back to the Frozen Four. And, and Michigan State had a great season for them, uh, but Michigan's headed back to a pretty familiar place. NCAA leading, uh, you know, NCAA leader in, in Frozen Four appearances. And the the last thing I'll say on hockey is. I think, you know, it's not like, you know, when you I feel like every night you, you log on to Twitter or X as it's now affectionately or disaffectionately referred to. And my entire feed some night, it feels like is the Michigan hockey account retweeting, you know, guys that are scoring goals in the NHL or guys that are right. making these incredible plays. And I think people see that and and see all the talent that they bring in and the draft picks that they wind up having on a year to year basis. And they're like, well, why aren't they like the Alabama or the Georgia of college hockey? And the one thing I'll say, I mean, hockey is the one sport where 
I think experience matters. Uh, you know, when you, I think body, you know, certainly body types in hockey, you know, you have these guys that are, you know, 150 pounds soaking wet as an 18 year old playing against, you know, these 24 year old um, guys that have been in college and have been in the weight program for a few years. And it is a little bit different in that regard. And also the fact that hockey is just so random, you know, you could, you could play the game of your life and a puck could bounce weird off of someone's rear end into the net. And that's your season's over. So um, yeah, I mean, we'll see what happens here. I mean, I know it's, it's not quite the same level of accomplishment as maybe a basketball final four is because it's a 68 team field, 64 team field, whatever it is, um, you know, college hockey 16, but to win two hockey games um, in a postseason environment is, is tough to do. So I give them credit for that and looking forward to, to watching them in a few weeks here. So moving on, uh, let's go to this one from, Ohio Wolverine, who says concern about reports of Wink's defense being heavy man coverage and blitz happy. Yeah, I mean, a little bit of concern always. Uh, I always say this concern's fine to have. I mean, you're always should be concerned about everything. Um, but and I do think Wink Martindale is going to be more aggressive than Jesse Minter, uh, probably than Mike McDonald as well. Um, you know, in in play a different style, even though it's the same system. You know, I think style and system are two different things. And then you even talk about in-game, calling a game. You know, he's going to call the game differently than Jesse and Mike did. And he he said that word for word when we talked to him a few weeks ago. So it's certainly going to be different. Uh, but I have confidence that Wink Martindale is going to put together good game plans on a week-to-week -week basis. You know, Mike McDonald said a few years ago that, they have a really expansive menu of things they can do, uh, but week to week, you know, it's it's smaller. It might be, you know, these five things that that we're going to do, but the next week it might be a completely different five. Um, so they can adapt to what the opponent's doing. They can adapt to what's working, what's not. And by nature of being in the NFL, you have to do that. And Wink Martindale has done that for a long time. So, you know, I, I do think they're going to play differently, but I think it can be as effective as long as the players are as good. I don't think the defense is going to be as good as last year, even though they say they want it to be. And of course it's great that they're shooting for that. And I would never tell them they can't achieve that. Um, you know, I'll believe it when I see it though, but you know, I, I don't necessarily see a huge concern there. Um, but anytime you're talking about maybe specific opponents, I would say, all right, I would maybe, you know, have played a little bit differently the way Jesse did. But it just remains to be seen, and he's not going to give away all the secrets either. Yeah, I mean, I think people hear man coverage and blitz and think, and we've talked about this a bunch, they automatically think Don Brown, and they go back to 2018 at Ohio State. Uh, I think you can play a lot of blitz, you know, a lot of man coverage, and be okay. You know, the key to all of it is being able to be pliable enough to adjust your game plan if – something gets exploited or to make those adjustments on the fly. And that's, you know, that was one of the biggest hangups of the pre Mike McDonald, uh, Jesse Minter era. I, I think that Wink Martindale has been around this game and called games, you know, at the highest possible level of the sport to know that you can't just, you can't just run, you know, you can't just blitz every single play and have that be something that, that works in your favor. You can't always play man coverage. So you know, the percentage is skewing one way or another. We'll see, but it's it's all about situationally. It's about how you decide to, you know, zig when your opponent zags. And, you know, so it, I don't – somewhere along the line, blitzing and playing man has gotten tied into with what some of the pitfalls of the pre-2021 Michigan football program were. And it's not – I just don't – I think that's a little bit disingenuous. That's all. Um so that I, I'm not overly concerned about it because I think I still think they have the better defensive players than most teams in the country when it comes to what this group will throw out there, but we'll see what happens. Um, I'll go to this other one from Ohio Wolverine. He says, why wasn't Christian Anderson a fit for dusty may what players currently in the portal? Do you feel Michigan has the best shot of landing? We'll stick with the Christian Anderson part, I guess first. I mean, it's a good question for Christian Anderson. And obviously, 
you know, we'll try to track that that story down. Uh, but you know, clearly they they had conversations, and one side or the other felt like it wasn't a fit. And you know, frankly, when a guy's signed, like Christian Anderson could come to Michigan, <laughs> like he, he signed his letter of intent. That's that's guaranteed. He could come play for Michigan basketball, and if he wants to, even if Dusty May says, "Hey, I don't think you're fit for my system." Well, sorry, he already signed a piece of paper, so he could come. It'd be him asking out, and he has done that. Um, you know, so I, I'm not exactly what sure what those conversations were. I, I think he could play in Dusty May's system. Um, you know, maybe not the top tier athlete, but he can certainly shoot. I think you know down the road he could be able to create offense for himself and others off the bounce. Uh, but it just doesn't seem like it's a fit. And, and as you said earlier, Darrell Brooks, uh, you know, the story we broke last week that he met with Dusty May on Tuesday night the same day that Dusty had his introductory press conference. And, you know, they had a conversation that apparently went a different way that, you know, he cemented his commitment with Michigan. He will be, you know, joining the team in the summer. So um, I'm not sure. I think Christian Anderson is going to be a pretty good player at the college level, but you know, I mean, it, it just seems like it's more of a question for Christian Anderson than anything. And I, I know I'm not saying it's a bad question at all. It's a great question. Uh, but, you know, long answer short, you know, is that we just don't know it at this point what made him make that decision. Yeah. And I don't think the question is why isn't Christian Anderson a fit for Dusty May? I mean, the question, and you basically just said this, but why isn't Dusty May a fit for Christian Anderson? Because again, he was a guy that was signed to the school. Um, you know, he's he's a terrific three point shooter. We know that they're going to th- you know shoot a ton of those. But again, you got to remember too. I mean, this is not this is a coaching change. And Christian Anderson committed to. Well, I did commit to Michigan. He was recruited by Juwan Howard and had that long standing relationship. I feel like he's been committed to Michigan for, or had been committed to Michigan for like five years. So, you know, when you have that relationship, and then all of a sudden it's you know not there, and maybe the vision's a little bit different than totally within his rights to do that. And um, maybe he decides to come back. I don't, we haven't heard anything that would suggest that that's going to be the case, but uh, cause his camp has kind of gone radio silent on it, but yeah, we'll see what you wish him well. And again, it's just an opportunity for someone else. And as far as the, you know, what players currently in the portal, I mean, it's, you know, uh, guys that can handle the ball, guys that can shoot guys that defend. I mean, that's, <laughs> It seems like it's basketball it's pretty. Player. Yeah, if you're good at basketball, I think you're a fit. I mean, they could have as many as eleven scholarships to fill. So it's who's a fit. I mean, anyone who, you know, not just anyone off the street, but they need a lot of everything. And they they need something at every single position. So, um, you know, Chris is working on a, a board of you know the guys that kind of we've been writing about them, having contact in and interest with, and we'll see what happens from there. But uh, it's tough to say. I mean, I think I would assume the names, obviously the names that are out there in terms of who they're linked to is who they think would fit them. So um, we'll just have to be patient. And I think it's, I think April is going to be a very busy month for this program in terms of getting guys signed and and in the program. Yeah. I, I would give two names. I mean, one Danny Wolf uh, seems like the obvious pick here. Uh, Yale big man who, can handle the basketball, can, can shoot, um, you know, and obviously played well in them upsetting Auburn in the, the first round of the NCAA tournament, uh, a big one that kind of emerged over the weekend as our Chris Ballas reported. So he would be the obvious pick in terms of best chance of, of Michigan landing. Um, and I think that would be a big one. You know, I mean, when you look at how Dusty May is going to try to piece this roster together, Vlad Golden from Florida Atlantic, another seven foot one guy, uh, would be another huge piece, and you're going to need a couple big men. You know, I think if they could get both of them, it'd be a coup. But I think one of them would be a, a really good addition. And then the only other guy, I mean, like you said, they've reached out to several players now in the transfer portal. And it's going to continue to happen as time goes on. It's just Dusty May right now that's currently on the staff. Um, obviously, some guys are, are still at Michigan that were working under Jawan Howard's staff. But in terms of the you know, the next chapter officially it's, it's Dusty May and it's him trying to fill out his staff and fill the roster out. But the only other guy that has actually listed, or, or I guess the only guy, because Danny Wolf's been more reports and, and Dante Maddox Jr. from Toledo has been the only guy that has listed Michigan in a top schools list. Um, Toledo guard who was second team all Mac last year, as you said at the top, this is the guy I'm writing about right now uh, in, you know, 
before this podcast and will after. So we'll have something at the Wolverine.com by the time people listen or, or watch this. But um, I would say that guy is, is another one. Maddox is somebody who you could put up there with, with the best chance of landing, but it's really early. And as you said, they're probably going to land like seven, eight guys out of the transfer portal. So, you know, there are going to be a lot of different directions. This whole thing goes. For sure. Uh, another guy I like wrote about him earlier today is Malik Mack. Um, point guard out of Harvard. Again, I, he's, he was a freshman this year, Ivy league freshman of the year, but I think obviously um, on three currently has him as I believe the number seven overall player that's available. So I think everyone and you know, anyone and everyone is probably going to be in the mix for him. So uh, we'll see what happens. I've said that a lot, but this is, it's never been more apparent that, we're going to have to be patient and see how it all comes together. Cause I've, we've never seen Michigan basketball turn a roster over like this. I mean, maybe I don't remember what the roster t- turnover was like early on in the beeline era, but um, you know, Jawan Howard pretty much had us uh, had a roster intact, a core group of guys. This is even the guys that might come back are kind of those role player type of dudes. So we will see what direction it goes. Uh, why don't you, how many more you want to take Clayton? I think we got, I think we just got several more, five or six more. All right. I'm, let's keep rolling along. Um, Melee Web 2 says, can we, can the um, basketball team build a solid team solely through the transfer portal? How long do you expect them to take to gel as a unit? My answer to that is, it depends on who you get. <laughs> I mean, you can absolutely do it. We saw teams do it, we saw Illinois do it. This past offseason, you know, Terrence Shannon was one of their only guys coming back that contributed him and Coleman Hawkins. And, you know, they built this team around the transfer portal, Marcus Damask and, and all these different guys. And they went to the Elite Eight um, and, and they're not the only team that has done it. We also saw a team like West Virginia that basically had to build its entire roster through the transfer portal. And they completely crashed and burned this past year, had to hire a new coach. And it did so with Drake's Darian DeVries coming over. So. It could go one of two ways. They could also be Penn State, which was one game under 500, very just okay for having to rebuild your entire roster. So it's just to be determined. In terms of them gelling as a unit is a great question. Also depends on who you get, you know, what their level experience is, how good they are, um, and, and, and what the staff does. But you know, that's one that also I, I just can't answer at this point because, and, and it will be fascinating to see because we haven't seen it at Michigan. Like you said, they haven't had to build this way. In, in the past yeah solid team I, mean, I guess it depends on what our definition of solid is 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 solid an ncaa tournament bubble team is solid a team that is somehow you know avoids playing in wednesday night at the big 10 tournament like i don't i don't know what that means yet uh but can they absolutely i really even think that i i think there is a road to that being competitive this year but you know competitive in the top half of the conference competitive for you know, I'll push to the second weekend of the NCAA tournament, which I think those two things to me are what, when things are rolling at Michigan, the expectation should be. Uh, I don't know. Again, it's all going to depend on what that roster looks like. So uh, let's go to, I like this one here from Big Blue Dog, who says, what home games do you expect to be our night games? And what games do you expect to see on Big Noon Saturday? Texas is supposedly a noon lock. Yeah, I think that's probably going to be what happens uh, with the Texas game, given that, you know, part of Texas's deal to get out of the Big 12 was that the locations of that game were flopped and Fox would get the broadcast. And if Fox has, you know, the week two broadcast, I assume it's going to be big noon. Uh, From there, you wouldn't be surprised for one of those other non conference games to be a night game. That seems to be a trend that's emerged the last few years. Um, you know, I'm sure there's going to be a Peacock exclusive game in there somewhere. Uh, I wouldn't. I, I think USC at night could be an interesting one sick. for TV. That'd be pretty um, sick. Although I'd love to see USC at big noon because it's not their body clocks would say it's 9 a.m. Uh, I don't think that's going to happen though. Um, I could see Washington. Well, that's not a home game, but I could see Washington being a night game, uh, given it's a national title rematch. Michigan State, they've liked making a night game of late. I think that's, I won't say a safe bet. Uh, Oregon is probably big noon. Let's see what else we have here. Yeah, I think that's, I think 
Texas and Oregon, I'm going to plant my flag now. Those are big noon Saturday. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see. I don't know how it works with who gets first pick on what week. Um, but I kind of hope USC is a night game. I think that'd be pretty awesome. It would be. Uh, any other thought? I mean, away games. You know, I think Ohio State, no no surprise there. That's going to be a noon game. Surprise it's not already announced. Uh, yeah. Any other big road <laughs> Any other big road games? It's really just that Washington game. So, yeah, I, I think that those those feel right. But then again, they love to throw curveballs. Like, hey, oh, you're playing Minnesota. Uh, let's put that at eight o'clock on NBC. So, or if it's like the one Big Ten network game that Michigan has to play contractually, and they throw it at night, you know, who knows? Yeah. Or if it, yeah, like a Peacock. I mean, if NBC has the pick, I think now more than ever, like pretty much everything's in play, other than. Ohio State, they'd have to like hold a press conference if Ohio State was going to be a night game, and they haven't yeah. done that yet. So I'm going to, you know, operate under the assumption that that's <laughs> not going to happen. But uh, because it would be such big news, and it would be a mistake too, by the way, um, for many reasons. You know, you but, you and I have talked about this too off pl- off platform. Is that I kind of like how they've had like the non conference night game. It seems like the last few years because that's you get that full day of watching games. If There's the weather's like- nice, you know, it's a long day, you know, a, a nice day of tailgating. It's and a pretty cool vibe as well. So I agree. Yeah, we'll and see. that's partly why Washington being out at night wouldn't be the worst thing. It'd be a tougher environment to play in, but we'd get more time to sailgate out there in, uh, I think it's Lake Washington, right? Um, unless I'm crazy. So that would be, that would be pretty sweet. Um, but also uh, Dr. Wolverine says 1997 football natty, 1998 hockey natty. 2023 football natty 2024 hockey natty question mark i know it worked out that way last time michigan won the natty in in both uh they won it in the same year so could be uh could be a good omen it's poetry it rhymes true yeah uh any other let's see what else we have here i like blue monsters question uh rank ranking the difficulty yeah all right, so Blue Monster wants to rank the difficulty of these five games on the 2024 schedule. Texas, USC, at Washington, Oregon, at OSU. Uh, shooting from the hip here, I'll go one to five. Ohio State, Ohio State, Texas. Let me change that. Ohio State, Oregon, Texas, USC, Washington. Yeah, I, I'm going to go with your what you originally said, which was at Ohio State, Texas, then Oregon, then USC, and then at Washington because of this. That game being early on in the year, I think Michigan's offense is going to be a work in progress. I think that Texas, I, I know they lose a decent amount, and they had some great portal additions in December, but they you know they're up there in returning production. They kind of know what they are. They have their quarterback back. Michigan is lucky this game's at home. And of course, you know, it doesn't mean like they're going to, to uh, you know, they're going to Austin in 2027. So it's just a flip of the coin there. And I know that game had to get flipped based on some TV stuff, uh, the location of it. But it, it feels good that that one's at home. At the same time, I think Texas is going to know more what it is. Returning coach, returning quarterback, all this stuff compared to Michigan. So that's why I have it second. I don't know that you could really see any of the other ones any differently. I know we agree on all the others. Um, USC is a wild card, though, too, to me. Yeah. For like, sure. I don't know what they're going to be. Like, new defense. I don't, I don't know that they know what they're going to be. That's right. that's they're a scary thing for out. them. Yeah. Um, you know, it's weird to say because, obviously, you want to win every single game. and and But is the Texas game not kind of a freebie? I don't – maybe freebie is not the word, but, you know – Let's just say they do lose to Texas, but they figure some stuff out in the progress or in, in process, and you know they it pushes them forward into the meat and potatoes of that Big Ten season. Is anyone going to care about the Texas game because ten and two, nine and three could still get you into this twelve team playoff? You, you mean is the is the committee not going to care? Or well, I mean Michigan fans will care, but in terms of if it's if they lose and it's something that propels them forward through the rest of the season. I mean, it's not really going to be a mark on their resume if they don't beat Texas. 
because they have all of this other opportunity in front of them. It, it would be a huge boost if they did beat them. Is the yes. only the only counter argument. So like it's it'd be a, an opportunity you didn't capitalize on. But I agree. It, you know, it, it would be a measuring stick. I know that that's going to someone's going to ask that. Is yeah, that 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 Texas game is going to tell you who you are and maybe right. who they are if they're for real or not. But and to your point, like the 2018 Notre Dame game to open the season felt like that to me where, you know, Michigan was coming off of the 2017 season, which was disappointing. They had a new quarterback, Michigan. That was, it was a tough loss, you know, and people went crazy. And after that game, but, and I was there and I remember coming back from South Bend and I was thinking Michigan's better at quarterback. Michigan's O-line held up and looked pretty legit. The defense allowed too many big plays. They, you know, they got schooled early and then they settled in, but they look pretty good and talented. It sucks they lost and everyone was freaking out, but it kind of feels like they have they have something here. And then they go win 10 straight games. So to your point, I, I think it's a good one um, where you're going to know where you're at. You're going to know where you need to be, you know, by the time, you know, whether it's USC comes in uh, a couple weeks later or, you know, you, you play your next, you know, big game after that in, in the meat of the Big Ten schedule. I, I think you're not going to get docked a ton by losing it. Obviously, the margin for error will go down if you do lose it, but you're going to have a good idea of where things stand. Yeah. And obviously too, like if you get killed, that's going to be concerning, but I'm just saying, sure. yeah, in general, I think that, uh, you know, even then, you know, the Notre Dame example that you cited, you win all your games after that and you're still set up to do something uh, special. And then uh, we've, I forgot what happened the rest of that year, but that's fine. Um, that team, Well, that team could have done well in a 12 team playoff. I will say. I think so too. I think that 20, that 2016 Michigan team still might have, you know, had a chance to win a national title. With that you defense, know, I, I think, yeah, they, they could have. I mean, uh, you got any more here? Did I miss that, anything? That's it for me, I think, from what I'm seeing. All right. Well, uh, I think that's a good place to put a pin in it. We went a little bit longer than I thought we would, but a lot of great questions. That speaks to the quality of our community, which, of course, you can use the promo code um one to get two months of access to the fort and the premium content at the Wolverine.com. Uh, use that promo code UM1 for two months for $1. I'll uh, be sure to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel here. Leave us a positive review wherever you listen to your podcasts. That's going to do it for us. Again, uh, the programming note for this week, Thursday, Clayton and I will be uh, chatting with Sam Munson of Pro Football Focus, uh, barring any breaking news, which again, We'll see what happens. It's one day at a time around these parts. But for Clayton Safey, for our producer Megan behind the scenes, I'm Anthony Broom. Thank you for tuning in, and we will talk to you again next time.